Come check us out at C2E2 August 5th through 7th. Hope to see you there. Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic. I remember it so you don't have to. Guess I'm on a Mike Myers kick. Yeah, I know, another YouTube critic talking about how amazing and groundbreaking Shrek is, how original. This film has been praised left and right over the years and has become such a part of pop culture, it still turns out merchandise, memes, and everyone seems to say most animated films nowadays owe a lot to either Toy Story or this. Whether it be the animation, dialogue, jokes, morals, story, almost every CG film has something that traces back to the style of one of these two films. So, what the hell can I say about this movie and its sequels over 20 years after its release in 2001? Well, how about I don't really get into this film. However, that has changed a little bit over time. A little. I want to bring the point of view of someone who did not fall in love with the first movie, but over time acknowledged there is an importance to it. The film was one of the earliest animated features from DreamWorks. Even Shrek's theme is still played whenever you see the DreamWorks animation logo. She waited in the Dragon's Keep, in the highest room. It stars Mike Myers as a gross loving ogre teamed up with a fast talking donkey played by Eddie Murphy performing the task of saving a princess, played by Cameron Diaz, for a selfish king, played by John Lithgow, and in return, having a bunch of fairy tale characters removed from his swamp. Attention all fairy tale things. Do not get comfortable. So I guess I'll start with what I didn't like about the film, what I do like about the film, and despite my thoughts, what relevance it has on today's culture. And after that, I'll move on to the air films to see if they had the same effect. So first off, let me say, I was one of the few people that was legit excited to see this movie. Everyone complained how the trailers looked really lame and it was gonna be nothing but fart jokes, but I could tell by the attitude of how it looked and how it sounded that there was gonna be a bit more bite to it. So, while a lot of people were surprised it had as much of an edge as it did, I was surprised it didn't have even more. I guess my first thought was this was going to be like The Simpsons telling a fairy tale. A very self-aware, self-satirizing, mean, and adult take on what we grew up with. Think what disenchantment would become. When I saw the film, I definitely got elements of that, but not as much as I was hoping. I guess I just didn't think a lot of these jokes were that funny. I love hearing Eddie Murphy talk, but I'm never hearing any good writing out of him. And if you don't mind me saying, if that don't work, your breath certainly will get the job done, cause you definitely need some Tic Tacs or something, cause your breath stinks! Myers is the same. I feel like it's just his Scottish shtick, which I want to laugh at, but it's just not giving me any material to latch onto. Don't do that! This? Yes, that! Yes? Yes, do it. Okay. Ah! I had a similar experience with the witches from Hocus Pocus or Jim Carrey from the first Sonic the Hedgehog movie. They're funny performances, just not saying funny things. Why is Donkey finding out the dragon is female and charming her that great? Not emotionally ready for a commitment of uh, this uh, magnitude. Really is the word I'm looking for, magnitude. Why is Shrek explaining how an onion has layers that hilarious? Ogres are like onions. End of story. Bye bye. See you later. Why is Fiona saying there's an arrow in your butt such amazing material? It was just... Oh. Oh. I've seen this movie so many times because people always say I'm missing something with the humor. And all these years later, most of it just never grabbed me. Now that's not to say nothing is funny, but we'll get to that in a bit. At least the cynical world and offbeat characters could stand out. And... Yeah, they do for a time. It loses me again though when it tries to act like it's giving this heartbreaking romance that's just the usual third act breakup with no laughs. There's absolutely nothing new to it, yet they're acting like they're giving us something new. 
If it was something that was really interesting, like a relationship issue people could identify with, honestly a little bit more like in the later films, I'd be okay. But the mishearing of what the other says confusing them for not loving each other. God, I hate these. I heard enough last night. You heard what I said? Every word. Who could love a hideous, ugly beast? Yeah, let's see him sulk. This is really gut-wrenching. I haven't seen this in a million other half-assed rom-coms. We just stay on them moping and doping for a while, and again, nothing funny or new is added. I don't follow why it's so emotional for so many people. I guess for a lot of audiences, they just accept this as part of the course, and I'd be lying if I said I didn't understand. I mean, I have cliches I put up with to get to the stuff I really like. Sometimes those cliches are the things I really like. These, though, just push all the wrong buttons for me. Everyone has their pet peeves that are hard for them to look over. These cliches are some of mine. Okay, I've laid into what I don't enjoy about the film. Let me get to what I do, because there really is quite a bit. I don't want to give the impression that I hate this movie, because there are so many good things in it. And the good things are whenever they try to do something different. When it goes dark, it goes mad dark. I remember seeing this with an audience and watching the scene where Fiona sings to a bird, and instead of tweeting along, she sings so loud she blows it up. That's already great, but then she looks down at the nest of eggs. Everyone in the audience was like, "Oh, is she gonna raise them? Nope, she cooks them right up. That is some great shit. The edgier moments in the film are where it comes alive. The gingerbread man saying, Eat me! <laughs> Blowing up innocent animals just for amusement. Even almost dropping a few swear words here and there. I like it on this fight that is so silly than made. What he's basically saying is he likes to get paid. The look of the film is also very unconventional. It's both kind of pretty and kind of ugly at the same time. Disney famously goes out of its way to make everything as pretty as possible, but here, even the pretty stuff has something a little off about it. And I'm sure that's intentional. Like, it's a fairy tale, but it's a very disturbed fairy tale. You can tell something's up. But probably the thing I like the most, the moral. How many times have you seen a Disney film where they say, don't judge a book by its cover, and then the cover is changed? I love Disney and most of us get the messages they're trying to get across, but they do renege on a lot of stuff. A sacrifice isn't always a sacrifice. Think you're too ugly to get the woman? You're right. But hey, believe hard enough and you can transform how you look. Well here, the happy ending isn't both people turning beautiful, it's both people turning into monsters. And they're okay with that. I remember again when I saw this with an audience and this scene began, everyone around me was kind of whispering, wouldn't it be kind of cool if she stayed an ogre? But they're like, nah, they wouldn't do that. But they stick the landing and stand by their message. And it's still a happy ending. It isn't the physical beauty that changes, it's the perception of it. And this gets to one of, honestly, a few reasons why I think this film is still relevant today. On top of the ending that doesn't cheat the audience, over time, I feel like there's more you can draw from it. There's been a lot explored in terms of identity in the past few decades, and when you see how Fiona acts with her love of, well, ogreish stuff Shrek loves, it makes sense her outside now represents how she feels on the inside. Like most good lessons, it's one that gets stronger the more you can connect it to both past and present predicaments. But on top of that, when this was released, PG had a little bit more of a bite to it. On that note, so many parents are showing their kids this movie thinking it's the same level as G movies that most PG movies have become. I've talked about this endlessly in the past, but this is a situation where it might work to everyone's advantage. This is, for lack of a better term, a hard PG. Sometimes it's even borderline PG-13. But everyone presents it as a kid's film because PG means practically G now. They show it along with Disney and Pixar movies. In fact, I think the understanding is kids kind of start with simple fairy tales of Disney, move on to the more adult ideas of Pixar, and then the meaner and more satirical humor of Shrek. Shrek is that movie I'm hearing more and more. Kids are shocked they're allowed to watch, and they're being shown it left and right. I think this is what Return to Oz or Secret of Nim was for me. Except the adult elements isn't how scary it is, it's how quote unquote inappropriate it is. Dick sized jokes, animal cruelty jokes, countless innuendos. There is a rite of passage to seeing a film like this as a child, but what makes it even more special is that it isn't just the humor that's more adult, it really is the message. The message is really good, and I'm almost shocked it isn't done more often, but 
part of that is kids love buying their pretty merchandise and in the end, the characters aren't pretty. But Shrek kinda changed the mold on that as tons of Shrek toys, dolls, shirts. Even people dressed up like the characters are still popular because everyone fell in love with them so much. Shrek went from what I thought was gonna be a more adult-geared family film to a kid's film that has out of nowhere adult jokes. I think that makes it even funnier to kids. Tonally, I guess it's a little inconsistent, but comedically, kids probably do laugh harder when they think they're being told a lesson, but a surprisingly dark joke is told at the same time. So yes, even though a lot of it doesn't land with me, I can see the importance of it and why it's such a good film for kids to grow up with. It's the naughty Disney, the more cynical Disney, the Disney that says, yeah, you know what? You are a monster. But monsters are cool, they're not boring, and maybe we all are in some unique way. It's both pessimistic, but kind of optimistic at the same time. And in the end, I think that means a lot more than whether or not it made this reviewer laugh. I'm a nostalgia critic guy, remember? So you don't have to. Wait, shit, I still got three movies! See Doug play Guardians of the Galaxy Fridays at 6 p.m. Central Time on Twitch. We also got a new schedule and material six days a week. Hope to see you there. Three years later in 2004, Shrek 2 was released. And I know you might think if I didn't get into the first one, I probably wouldn't be able to get into this one. Actually, it's not only my favorite Shrek film, but it is one of my favorite comedies of all time. This is what I thought the first film was going to be, and while it arguably doesn't have as big a cultural impact as the first one, it's touching, clever, charming, and it is so goddamn funny. They throw kid jokes and adult jokes at you every chance they can, in the foreground, in the background, verbally, visually, and all of them work in one way or another. We got a white Bronco heading east into the forest, requesting backup. I say we take the sword and neuter him right here. Give him the Bob Baca treatment. We represent the workers in all magical industries, both evil and benign. Someday I will repay you. Unless, of course, I can't find you or if I forget. The story is Shrek and Fiona have to meet her parents, who don't yet know Fiona is still an ogre, and on top of that, she married an ogre. While trying to fight off her parents' prejudice, the fairy godmother and her son, Prince Charming, were originally slated to wed into the royal family and try to find a way to still make that happen. This leads to a hitman, or hit cat being unleashed, everybody getting transformed into beautiful alter egos, and naturally people finding out what really matters to them and who they are. Putting the humor aside for a minute, everything flows as perfectly as it could in a movie like this. I love everybody in this flick. They are so much more charming and likable to me. I really like Shrek and Fiona as a couple in this one. They're kind of like Gomez and Morticia. They find comfort in the things many don't find comfort in, and they have great chemistry. Donkey's writing finally matches his energy, with so many hilarious lines, but also a pretty fun rivalry between him and Puss in Boots, played by Antonio Banderas. I know you're feeling bad, but you gotta let your own- <laughs> You little hairy little licking sucker. Yes, the evil plan is a little formulaic, but even when they're being manipulated in kind of a third act breakup, you can still sympathize with it. Shrek and Fiona want to see each other happy, and they're tricked into thinking they will be if they stay apart. I love her. If you really love her, you'll let her go. To me, that's much more telling and heartbreaking than just misunderstanding what the others said. They'll legit sacrifice their happiness for the others. That's really pretty touching and makes the villains look even more evil. This film is also crazy creative. The different ways they get across different jokes and even action sequences is so outside the box and even gets your adrenaline up. I could watch the I Need a Hero song sequence a million times and never get bored of it. The new characters are great, the dilemmas are great. Even on the rare chance a joke doesn't get a hard laugh, it's still cute because it's always tied into something interesting or likable about these characters. I love when the bartender says, why the long face to the horse? Hey, why the long face? That's maybe one of the oldest and corniest jokes in existence, but Donkey gives a look like, cute. We're going through something here, but cute. If he didn't give that look, I don't think this would have worked. This movie has so much personality, so much energy, so much ingenuity, and so much better writing, it's one of the few flicks that comes dangerously close to being a perfect film for me. 
I could put it on right now knowing every joke that was coming and still laugh my ass off. As well as feel legit emotion for the characters too. I know I probably lost a lot of you with my thoughts on the first film. Just know though that not only do I love the second one, in my opinion, it's a comedic masterpiece. And then, you know, this happened. In 2007, Shrek the Third was released, and while well, not a god-awful movie, it's definitely not a good one either. Shrek discovers not only that he's going to be a father, but also he might be king of Far Far Away after Fiona's father passes. Desperate to escape his responsibilities, he tries to find another king and young Arthur, voiced by Justin Timberlake. Along the way, he warms up how to be a father while looking after him, but on top of that, evil forces from the past return to seize control. This is a film that, on paper, should work. All the pieces are there. It seems like this is the next logical step, but everything is just off. Not in a funny or clever way, just in an off way. Well, somebody better be dying. <laughs> I'm dying. The timing is off, the pacing is off, even the villain is kind of off. It's Prince Charming again. Yeah, every film has a unique villain except this one where they just repeat the previous one. Hell, half the previous ones. There are some good bits, like Eric Idle as the less than sensitive Merlin is pretty funny. Whew, proper head case you are, aren't you? <laughs> really messed up. Whoa. The princesses using their dainty powers as a weapon isn't bad. And occasional moments like Pinocchio trying to double, triple, even quadruple talk to make it sound like he's not telling the truth. You don't know where Shrek is. Why did the inaccurate to assume that I couldn't exactly not say that this or isn't almost partially incorrect? But for the most part, it just feels like an obligation movie. In Shrek 2, everything felt upped. There was a passion and even a thankfulness that the first movie was such a hit. So they went out of their way to make the funniest, heartfelt, but still edgiest comedy a family film would allow. This feels like they're just doing the third one. We have a franchise now. What do people want to see as opposed to what do we want to make? It got a couple laughs, but it felt soulless. And whatever you thought of the first two, you definitely couldn't say they were soulless. While the film still did well at the box office, nobody was really repeating any of the lines or talking about any of the scenes they just watched. Which is probably why the series ended on a better, but still not that great note in 2010, Shrek Forever After. This is probably the most okay out of the series. It's not insulting, but it's not hilarious. It's just another Shrek sequel. But I will say, you can feel them trying to get the original magic back. Shrek is getting sick of his daily routine being interrupted by fatherhood, so he makes a deal with the schemer Rumpelstiltskin. He says he'll give him a day of relaxation if he can erase one day from his life. Having clearly never read anything in his life, he just trusts him and doesn't see any tricks to it. He accepts his offer and Rumpel erases the day he was born, resulting in the future being ruined for many as he becomes king. Shrek teams up with an army of rebel ogres led by Fiona and obviously comes to grips with how good he had it all along. My biggest gripe is despite how sympathetic we are to Shrek losing his free time, he is way too mean to Fiona in the opening. Saying he wishes he never saved her from the tower or had kids. Back when the world made sense. Back before you rescued me from the dragon's keep. Exactly. That's probably the biggest hurdle the film has because it's very hard to root for him after that. With that said, the jokes are better. The different ways people are affected by Shrek's absence are familiar, but still pretty humorous. What are you doing? Collecting my bounty! What are you talking about, cracker? Even some of the action is creative, like the ogres trying to fight the Pipe Piper while being forced to dance to his flute. You can definitely feel the effort, but it's pretty impossible not to just see this as another film in a franchise. There was always a feeling the first two movies were doing something new and exciting, and this one, while better than the previous, is just kind of doing what's been set up as the Shrek formula now. Shrek has an issue with his family life. He'll learn to be thankful for what he has. Puss in Boots has to do the big eye thing. Some spell transforms something and comedic consequences ensue. It's not bad, but it's not special anymore. Apparently everyone thought the same thing because they haven't made another film since. And honestly, they don't have to. Even someone like me who's not in love with the original acknowledges the positive impact it's had. And even then, I did find a Shrek film I fell in love with, it was just off by one. It's always rumored there's gonna be another one, but I don't know if people really wanna see that. 
While the fourth one isn't great, it's a better send-off than the third one, and the first two won over so many, we don't need the table scraps. It's kind of funny to think these raunchy, mean, kind of twisted movies are developing so many kids who are growing up right now. But I really do see that more as a positive than a negative. I like that they're the kids' films that both children and adults can come together on and say, we know you shouldn't be watching this, but we're gonna show it to you anyway. There's something special watching something that feels a little naughty compared to other kids' stuff, but still makes you laugh and even teaches you something rather important. There is surprisingly a long-lasting power to them. And as long as parents and kids understand, eh, that an appropriate joke is okay, it's Shrek. Maybe it really is okay. Maybe even a lot better than okay. I'm the Nostalgia Critic Guy, remember it, so you don't have to. What are you talking about, Cracker? Hey everybody, Cameo for Charity is still going great, and all through the month of July, we're doing Raise a Child. Raise a Child is the nationwide leader in the recruitment and support of all prospective parents. They host free information events and parent matching events to help support growing families, and through the process of fostering and fostering to adopt, they offer resources and guidance. So if you want a cameo from me saying happy birthday or good luck or whatever, just click on the link below and the money won't be going to me, it'll be going to this wonderful organization. And even if you're like, screw your face, I don't want a cameo from you at all, well at least give this organization a look. It's got a great rating on Charity Navigator and it's well worth your time. Click on the link and check it out. <laughs>